And uh, you see it after, I mean, before she was all, the, the bars and things downtown, you know, the Dry Brothers, you heard her, Chris and Bun Dry. Yeah. They had those, they run, they run, they were just so, I, I don't say they was gamblers or anything, but they was run the town like they had all the bars, they had all the restaurants and everything, and, and then right down Diamond Street down there, that was a house of like the house of blue, blue the blue houses, the women, the women was uh, those prostitutes, mm -hmm. women houses down there, and uh, they had the whole down the street down there, and uh, all the way, I mean, we didn't go there because we were scared to go there, because when we were kids, because then we would hang around there and those little flimsy dresses and things like that. Oh, we used to just wish we had some of them beautiful clothes that the women were wearing <laughs> like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was their life. That was their life, and that they, I guess they uh, entertained men and anything would come in through there. And uh, I would like to know that you know Bun used to have so many bars down there. We used to go sometime when I got old enough to go to the bar. We used to go down to Bun Dries. Because well, I knew some of the people that used to go down there. Oh, the, the chocolate bar they used to call the one? No, no, no. One drive was right down the corner on 6 and on six in uh, uh, Main, uh, Adam, Adam right there. All that stuff was tore down now. Oh, oh where well, the post there. office is, that was the a hot spot down there. Yeah, down. That was, um, so yeah that, that's, that's the flats. Okay, yeah. so. Now that what you were talking about, what you called the blue houses, or is that my yeah, the, what you call the blue houses, houses the real houses of ill repute. <laughs> that where was that? That was on Sixth Street. No, it was on Diamond Street. Diamond, Diamond Franklin, right around there. All okay, the houses right around there. Mm -hmm. Where the post office is now, where they tore all that down. Yeah, okay. Down. Yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, we had uh, where well, the Hoots Bar was down there. Where the teenagers would go after skating, you know. Uh, that was uh, what was that? What was Hoots' name? Elroy. El Royale, but uh, he had, it was a barber shop, and then he had a little place where you can go and dance in the back, you know, and that's where the kids would go in the, in, at nighttime, and he'd close up about 11 o'clock, but uh, other than that, those were just the little places that we would go to as teenagers, but we didn't, we didn't places, fight, we didn't have no fights and yeah. no drugs and stuff like that, it was just but kids being out and having yeah. a good time. But you know, that's why I said the kids now don't don't have those kind of good times, you know. Skating rink was the thing, you know. On Monday night, everybody wanted to skate, you know. The girls wanted to be out there, and the guys wanted to be out there. And then, uh, like I say, the friendly house, the dance. Everybody wanted to learn to dance. If you didn't know how to dance, you go down there because somebody had the newest steps, you know. And that was the place to be. And then you go home. So you had to do that. But now they don't have that. And so it's just really rough. When when you went to the the friendly house for a dance, was it? Did they have a band play, or was it they no, just play records? No, they played okay. records. Mm -hmm. But did, did they have like a DJ, or was it just hey, no, I brought a record no. from home? There was home, no such or? thing as a DJ. A DJ you okay. just had the record player. Okay, so folks would bring records with them. Is that how I it worked, think, or uh, they? Um, yeah, you could bring a, uh, whatever was the newest record. You know, mm -hmm. somebody always had it, but. Um, well, so was the people named the Randall Fair, Gimbals. They, 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 Gimble, they, Gimble. Uh -huh, the Gimbals, they always had it set up for you. Well, and they, the kids, had, they had the, the place for so long, because, see, when I was young, we used to go there, because it used to be around Main Street down there, where it tore down there, and uh, we used to go there, so we learned how to slant to swim, and I mean, we just skated, and we sewed, and, and cooked. Yeah. We did everything, we learned everything there. Because one other place where to go to there, and after school, that's where all the kids went right down to the friendly house to, uh, you know, have entertainment and things like that. And most of the young people now, that they didn't know what the friendly house was all about. Because the friendly house now, you got to pay to go in there now, mm -hmm. and you got cause they got a swimming pool and everything there. Well, we we had a swimming pool too, but uh, nothing like you got now. You know, everything was just. Uh, so these activities that you're describing were they formal classes? Like, would you go and learn? It was to just every every after after school or some place to go. That was a place always open so that you could go there. Your parents took made you go there. They they uh, I, I, they wouldn't not set babysitting class. But anyway, when you went there, you went there. You went to learn. You didn't go there to to uh, 
run them down the street. Mm -hmm. They kept you there and they learned you how to do different things and cook and learn a woman how to be women and men to be men, I would say it like that. Because uh, I, I said all the, the girls that I knew come out of there, they come out to be pretty good girls, you know what I mean? I mean, the things that happen now, these kids, I mean, we didn't know anything about. These yeah. kids now is, is outrageous with what they're doing now. Yeah, we tried we tried to have a class like that at the Creveling School after school. Uh, we were, uh, in fact, it was a, a doctor, um, what's the eye doctor's name? Twig? Dr. Twig, yeah. His, his uh, son's wife. We were having a class for young girls after school, and this we were trying to teach them how to sew. Mm -hmm. She had machines there, and you know she has quilting classes and stuff. And so we were volunteering to come down and help these young girls learn how to sew a stitch and quilt. And to, we were going to make a quilted jacket and everything. These girls are not interested in it. When they got down there, you know, they were talking about what boy was cute today at school and all. And she says, "Oh, I'm mighty afraid these little girls are not going to make it through school." <laughs> These were girls that were in the seventh grade. They were, they were, they acted like they were like 25 or 30 years old. They were not interested in sewing nothing. And they get down there and then they get to arguing if they like the same boy, you know. And we just, we said, are we wasting our time or what? Because they did not care. And then they would have, um, you want them to show them how to cook. You know, the average one don't know how to cook right now. And uh, they can't sew a, they can't even hem a skirt, nothing. And I said, they don't want to. It's just all about boys. Boys are in danger. Wow. They really, really are. How is it, how is it different today? You feel like that's how it's different? Yeah, uh-huh. The girl, the, the girls are, what I say, they're more aggressive. You know, we, we were kind of, if the boy didn't say anything to us, we didn't say nothing. Now these girls today, they go after a boy, and it might be three of them after the same boy. You know, they're very aggressive. They don't, they don't even care. And that's why you have so many fights at the school. 90% of the fights they have at school are girls, fighting girls, over a boy. Wow. And, uh, and it's my, my one friend, she says, they always say, never get in between two girls that are fighting because you're going to get beat up. And she was a teacher's aide, and she, she tried to break one up and the other girl picked up a chair and went to hit the girl over the head and in fact it hit her. That was Margaret Ferguson. Hit her over I'm the head. About these <laughs> about these yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hit her and she, she had to go out on disability. And she was like almost fifty some years old and trying to break up two girls fighting. I've seen the principal try to break up and he get beat up. They, they just jump right on him and just beat him up right in the fight. So they said, you, if you ain't got no mace, <laughs> don't bother. Now, you probably know that, how them girls are at school. <laughs> You've seen it. I heard the stories, yeah. <laughs> but she has all that after, Yeah. So after, I, and I don't know enough about that stuff. Yeah, girl, girls are really, I, really I kids, rough. As I said, kids were so much different then. Yeah. When I come along there, what? They come along. Mm -hmm. My kids, my kids, I can say, come I never had a fight. Class. I, I never, you different know, class. Of yeah, but this, 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 these girls now, they, they, mm -hmm. they look at each other, and you look at each other, wrong, they're ready to fight right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is, it is scary because I says, you never get a husband because a man would be afraid you're going to jump on him, you know? And that's why, well, a lot of them say they don't want to be married anyway because they don't want nobody to tell them nothing. So, they would rather be single, but they if they want to have a kid, they pick out the guy. They pick him out. I never forget the girl picked out my son. Yep. Called him up on the telephone. He didn't even know her. Wow. So I got a granddaughter. She's the granddaughter, she's what's the name? Twenty two, twenty three now. Yeah. It's so a different she's a different world yeah. altogether. So what was life like for African Americans in Mansfield in, in the 40s and the 50s? What happened? What, 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 was, like, what was life like for African Americans? For African Americans? Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. There wasn't that many of them anyway. Well, that's the age around that she was being born around the 40s. So, uh, so a lot of things happened before that she was born. What was going around then 
like, you know, this, most of the young men was going to the service at the time because that was right after the war come on, you know. And so a lot of the young boys, some of them didn't graduate, they went on to school, uh, got into services and things like that because uh, it was a it's a promising job for him in a way to get a job in the service and things like that. So I think Mansell was just kind of a bare town in a way because when the, when the, my first, we moved to Cleveland because the jobs in Mansfield wasn't like it were in the big towns, I guess, or the war jobs. And uh, I took my kids, I think she was a baby. She, I had two babies, two babies, her and her, my other daughter. And uh, we moved to Cleveland, my husband did, because he said he'd get better jobs there because the steel mills and things like that was hiring men and they was paying good money and things like that for him. So that's why we moved to Cleveland there. And, and I, I'm sorry I ever moved there, but we moved there. <laughs> we lived there during the time, that, you know, the war time was going. Then as soon as it got the war room, got down, the guys come from the service and things like that, they couldn't get a job. They couldn't find no kind of work to do or nothing like that, and they was just homeless. And so we had to leave Cleveland and come back to Mansfield to live in a way because Mansfield, the, uh, they didn't have that kind of jobs and things, but we did find homes to stay in because we, we bought a little house on on Bowen Street on 1950 and um, been there ever since, to tell you the truth about it. But uh, it's this idea that it just wasn't, wasn't town like it was, but, you know, didn't have nothing, that, nothing but men to do. They had to come and find the job best they could do, and, and some of the guys made made bums of yourself because they said he couldn't find jobs. But when you couldn't get jobs, they started doing a lot of other things, stealing, everything else they could do. So uh, it was kind of rough, I think, around, around the forties. Even, even here, the jobs weren't really opened up to young blacks. But they could get, you know, servital jobs in the factories. They just started letting, because they had come home from the service, if they had a military behind them, they could get in quicker no, than a person that always, wasn't. But it was very, very hard to make a living. Always, because the jobs were mostly taken. See, some of you were still here from, they didn't go to service. They had the jobs. So when the other ones come from service, wasn't opening for them. You know what they did at Westinghouse, I don't know if they did it at the other factories, but if your husband went to the service, then you as a wife could maintain his job. And so they brought the women in to work the jobs while the men were in service. And then when the men come back, they, you know, these are white men now. These men could come right in on their job, get their job back, and then the wife seniority went on and she kept her job. So they had two people in the family working. Now, the young blacks could not get in there because there was no black women working in there in the first place. You wouldn't have gonna get in there. And so you had to come in new, and if you knew somebody that could get you in, uh, say, if your mother worked for one of the presidents of the factories, or if she was a domestic, and her kids came home, she could ask him to uh, get them a job. Now, I know a lot of people got in jobs like that, in fact, you know, remember mom, grandma, grandma worked for Mr. Sharp, mm -hmm. and he was the engineer down at Tappins. Well, she told him her grandson needed a job. I think Juno got on down there, I think Carolyn got on down there, Stevie got on down there. You had to know somebody to get yeah, into yeah. the job. And then that, that was your the token into the job. Other than that, you was not going to get in there. So, Mrs. Remmer, can you give us any insight into before you went to Cleveland? It, it was, was clearly that much harder for blacks well, to get yeah, work. There was nothing open for them then, period. And this, uh, when the war came along, that gave them either they could find better jobs, you know, like in those factories and things like mm -hmm. that, or they uh, went on to services. Mm -hmm. yeah. what My was husband the WPA? went to the service. Huh? What was the WPA? That, that uh, working program that uh, Roosevelt oh, got for yeah. those boys. Okay. Up to there. And my husband was in the uh, that work uh, program there for a while there on that. And what was and he doing in that? What what sort of work did they have him do? Was that th in a factory or was that working? No, like it's a job like cleaning streets. Okay. And doing those little jobs like that, but okay. they had, had work for them to do. You know. What about like railroad jobs? Was there some of that? Oh, I don't know so much about the railroad jobs because. 
uh, most of the job, the we had we did have a train station. Remember we had a train station in Mansfield. Where was that? Right on the corner of Diamond and, and um, Franklin down there. Right, you know where the you know, the uh, Ohio Brass is. Mm -hmm. Well, across the street there was a we had a, oh, a big, railroad station there. Railroad station had trains would come of the Peace, Pennsylvania, and the B&O. One would go, one would yeah, go. So, the, cross so it wasn't where, like, Mount Calvary is. Well, no, it's it down, was the down the other the road, way. Down, to, down the lower, there, oh. yeah, before the, right, right by the Ohio Brass. Okay. Ohio Brass and uh, the other, what's the other factories to be over there? The uh, Brickyard? No, 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 no. The one they tore down there off, of, off Newman Street there. Oh, uh, the, oh Mansfield Tire. Mansfield Tire. Yeah, Mansfield yeah. Tire, all that right there. Nice. Right in that neighborhood, there was a big... We had a big, you go down there and they can see You could go down there. under the ground and come up under the tracks to get to the other side. Because every time I go there, see my uh, job offices in the Ohio Brass, and I said, now where was those train stations at, right? Because I used to be afraid to cross the tracks because mm -hmm. you had to go across the tracks there. But it's both tracks, they go this way. One comes on this way and the other one goes that way. Going a different way but they yeah, did. but there was a station that... They had a good station, just like, like that. We had a good bus station with everything you know you needed mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And I don't know why they tired them things down because now we don't have a bus station, we have a train station, we have nothing like that. This there. was like the industrial center of North Central Mans Ohio. Mansfield, Mansfield was, was the industrial center. Yeah, this this was the end and we had the railroad here and we had everything. Uh, uh, all the all the Westinghouse made all, all the, the works, appliances. All the works. There was. Um, um, Tappins making the ranges, mm -hmm. the Mans Westing, uh, well, Mansfield Tire, mm -hmm. and then you had the smaller factories there, Humphreys, uh, Humphreys, oh, and then uh, what's the what, what's the one where all the women work? Um, mm, oh, they say name it's right Tapp there. On, uh, I don't think right there on Fourth Street. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the women's there, they start hiring a lot of black women there. And they would give you a loan for three hundred dollars. You could always borrow that from the credit union. And a lot of blacks borrowed the three hundred dollars, and they bought houses. And that's why you got the area up there by Hedges School. That's up there. There never was any black people living up there past Second Street. And then all of a sudden, they got all them new homes up there, and they allowed them to put a three hundred dollar down payment and buy them on land contract. Now the whole area is all black. Mm -hmm. It's all black now, but it was all white before that. Because I I used to be a cashier at, at the Super X drugstore, and the one girl asked me, this is a white girl, she says, uh, do you know any of your friends that are getting ready to buy houses up, uh, what's the name of the street, what hill, Dale Avenue up there? I said, no. She said, well, the real estate man came by and told us that uh, a lot of blacks are getting ready to buy these houses. If we wanted to sell our house, uh, to let him know. And then I told her, I said, I don't know anybody who wanted to buy a house up there. It wasn't two years later that every house up there was sold. And it's, if you go up there, it's an all-black area. Yeah, Home, Dale, uh, all of them. There's all, it's up around that swimming pool there. There used to be no blacks up there. No black people lived past Second Street. My two families on First Street. That was it. And that's and then this and then, and now that they're calling this North End thing, uh, this is when they divided the schools. You know, uh, used to be that side of town went to Appleseed for junior high, and this side was John Simpson. They kept moving the line. Then when they got ready to make senior high in Malabar, they had to move the line again. And it just caused a conflict in the town because everybody in town are kin to each other just about. Mm -hmm. So but the, the, they, 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 they created those areas. And so now, you know, as, as you move and as you got a better paying job and you made more money, you bought a house that cost a little bit more, you know. Because when I bought my house on the street that I live on, Auburn Street, the next street over from Gray Street, there was not a black person on that street. I remember as a kid, we used to go on the paper drive. They didn't want you to walk down the street. It was all German. That's all German town over there. Watch works, you know. That's sure. all German. And now, now our street is still mixed pretty much. So, because a lot of the German people didn't move away, but uh, there was none over there. There was you could count them. The Kleins lived on the corner of 
First Avenue. Robinson lived on Second Avenue. You know, one family. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Wow. The rest of them lived on Oakenwall, and it was all a mix of Oakenwall was still the country, like but they still at the time had outside everything. So you had kind of a mixed area. A lot of people moving in from Kentucky that were Merck working, they lived up there. Okay. But did, uh oh, sorry. Did racial did racial bias affect you? No. Ra racial bias like racial issues. Prejudice. Prejudice. I said that again, I can't hear Prejudice. It. Did, did it affect you? Did you have any like prejudice um moments well you know where I from when I come when we come to Mansfield they had that Bowman Street school up there but my mother never did want us to go to no school like that I went to an all-white school sometimes only black in my my class and so I wasn't never so I never was associated those kids so I got to St. John Simpson from knocked on Bowman Street there and um, so my mother just never would put us go to no school like that she didn't believe in that um, ratio. Uh, we, cause the little, all the places around, we had a lot of little white land around them. They were poor like we were. You know what I mean? They wouldn't, uh, uh, I guess they wanted to say the ditty people. So we just was in a neighborhood where it was a mix, mix of white and black, but we was all poor people. And we loved each other. We went to each other's house, ate and cooked and did everything like that. and. Uh, they sleep at my house and we sleep at their house. So I don't, I, I mean, I just said, I don't know nothing about some of this folks, the erection things like that. So my mother didn't raise us like that. And when and I, I lived, don't like it now. Then when I lived in Cleveland, I started school in Cleveland, kindergarten, first grade. The R.B. Hayes it was all black school. There was no white kids in the school. And we had a couple of white teachers. There was all, all the kids were black. So when I come back to Mansfield, you know, it's, well, we lived over in the state of Oklahoma first, but most of the people over there was white, and so it was no big, big thing. So we made a lot of friends, but it, it was just it wasn't no big thing. No, it was white. They yeah, were white. They, they, they just poor like we yeah. were. Yeah, and my friends they go home. I say, well, where where are you guys from? You know, they said down home. Where is down home? It's MacArthur, Ohio. I don't even know where that's at. <laughs> it's Mar MacArthur, Ohio. Well, what was what's so fascinating about them, the Havers, they had bright red hair. I had never seen nobody with red hair, you know, growing up. And we got to be real good friends, you know. Then I moved over on the Bowman Street side. That was a whole new world over there. It was a whole different ball game over there because the, the, the blacks over there was tight-knit family and this, that's just the way they were, and they didn't mix too well. Really? Whites. No, they did not. And um, the white people that live around the corner, I say around the little Kentucky, I know they'd be on the bus first, the bus picked them up first. And they, I guess they were probably scared because they got down to Crystal Spring, boy, oh boy. <laughs> I was sometimes scared to get on a bus myself, you know. And I have rode the school bus where they have had a fight on the bus. And whoever was fighting, the whole bus fell backwards. You know, everybody on the bus fell back on the floor. Just for no reason. Getting that somebody stepped on their shoe today. And just, I used to walk to school sometimes. Just not <laughs> get on the bus. Did, the, did uh, the civil rights movement affect you any? Like in the 60s? Civil rights. Yeah, the civil, the civil rights movement. I was going down to my husband's military base. See, I told you I got married at 17. My husband was in the Marine Corps. And I had just had our new baby. I was about 18, going on 19. And I was going to go down to visit. But he told me, you know, he's going to get a place where we can stay on the base. He said, now when you get on the bus, don't get off the bus. Don't, you have to change buses. Change buses in Washington, D.C. He says, and then when you get on the bus, do not get off for anything. Now, I got a baby that, that drinks milk, you know. He said, and if you do, remember, they got the Jim Crow law. Well, what is the Jim Crow law? I ain't never heard of that. Then I got to say, well, we read about it in school, but I don't know what it was. So I said, well, what is that? He said, well, blacks cannot go 
in the uh, same place in whites. I said, okay. So here I get on this bus. And so this white lady was on the, sitting with me and she says, uh, well, Greyhound goes all the way to Richmond, Virginia. I said, well, I wonder why my husband told me to get off in Washington, D.C. then. I said, well, I'll ride it all the way to Richmond, Virginia. Well, what I didn't know is I had to change the trailways and trailways was four blocks down the street. So now I'm getting off, I got a baby in my arm, I got a diaper bag and a suitcase. So this lady said, well, let me carry the suitcase for you. She said, because I don't have a big case. She said, she was going, I forget where she was going. So we were walking down Richmond, Virginia Street, being carrying a baby when we get to the bus station. We go in and she goes in, she sets my suitcase down and we sit down. And then I go up to the thing and the lady says, uh, you can't be in here, you have to go around. I want to get some milk. You have to go around to the back. I said, around the back, to where? She said, you have to go around to the black waiting room. I says, where is that? And she showed me, and it wasn't even a waiting room, it was like a window on the outside of the building to get stuff. And I said, oh my God, I says, and here I had a le I had a full length leather coat on and it was like 60, 70 degrees down there. When I left here in November, it was freezing. And I said, oh my God, I said, I done got in the wrong place. So now I'm getting on the, the bus comes and I get on the bus. So I'm trying to keep my baby quiet. Now he's six months old, so you know, he's more active. And so he says, uh, when you get down there, just get on the bus and get just go and sit down on the back of the bus. I said, so on the back of the bus? I'm always sitting behind the bus driver because I always make sure he don't speed. And, <laughs> and so I, I went on, I got on the bus and it, it rode all the way down there. And the bus stopped at every house looked like on the way down there. Well, got to the military base in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Now I have to get on the bus to go out to the base. All these men got on the bus, no women. So I asked the bus driver, I said, I'm trying to get to the base. And he told me, yeah, this is the bus to take you out to the base. Well, see, when you're in the service in Jacksonville, even in the military, and we ran into it so bad, you're still segregated in the town. Now, you got to sit on the back of the bus, the military guys, you know, they get on. After I get out there to the bus station, his he's on duty, so his CO picked me up, take me to the hostess house where I stayed. Well, he had already got us in a park in town in Jacksonville. All black people live that side of the railroad track. They have one black policeman. He only arrests black people. You can't go to the movie. At the, and even though they have black entertainers at the bars, you cannot go. I went into the rest. We went to a restaurant. That's when we went, was going to get a milkshake. Can't sit down. And I, my husband said, and I'm in the military and I can't. She said, you can buy it, but you can't sit in here to drink it. I said, oh my gosh. I didn't know my second kid died. We had to bury him in a black cemetery. I didn't know there was such a thing. And everything was separated, everything. And that's why I think when Robert Kennedy came down through there as attorney general and he said, everything is off limits if the service man can't go to it, they needed it because you were in the military fighting for the country and you can't go here, you can't go there, you can't sit here, you can't, you know, you, you, on the base you're okay. But if you leave the base, you know, it's not like that. So now, I guess it's a lot different now. But I think all of the towns had to kind of their own segregation law. But as far as, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, now, like I said, I was raised up north. All I know is northern people. And they thought I was a northern girl because I didn't talk a southern brawl. I didn't act a, act a Negro from the south or something like that. And everybody thought I li I was born up here because I, I talked like I was that But I said, now, there's some places that you could not go, you know what I mean? And yet there were still some that places that didn't, they didn't care, you know what I mean? So I said, like I said, we were just poor 
blacks and poor whites together. So, I mean, it was no segregation law there. Maybe if you went to a certain place, you know that you wasn't supposed to go there. Why keep going there and you know you wasn't go and w welcome there, you know? So I thought we learned, we know our places, you know, we know some places that we shouldn't go and some places we didn't have to go, didn't want to go, we tell you the truth about it. Right. But as far as uh, is this here uh, being that segregation law, I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I've never went to the South to be, be uh, uh, heard all this stuff about, I hear about how the South went, but I've never been there to know about it. I've never, I was born in Gaston, Alabama. I left there in, I said 1929, come back to Mansfield, and I've been in Mansfield. I was such seven years old when I come here, and I've been here ever since. So. It never bothered me, and it still don't bother me because I mean, I gotta, as I said, you've never all, been back down there. Never been, never, never been. been I've down. been down to Florida. I've been in different places like that, but I never really lived down nowhere. Yeah. But the idea is that I just never took took it as something that I should get mad at that or go look for something like that. I just never did. So I guess it's just I everything got its own laws to it. I mean, I said Mansfield, a small town, but Mansfield was a big town. I said a town. Because I know when Mansfield was the biggest town in, in this in this Richmond kind of almost, and uh, when we come here, uh, uh, Ontario was done but a street running through Mansfield. Now it's it's done took over Mansfield. Yeah. Mansfield is a street, and Ontario is a town almost. Yeah. So I see. I said, well, see that's uh, segregating there, because that was all a white town place. Ontario was a time. But now, what is it? Every, anything. Everybody can come there and live, get your houses and things and everything. I know more folks over there in Ontario than I do in Mansfield. Well, the thing, the thing of it is, uh, the people, Mansfield has really, really changed. It is more like a southern town now. Before, everybody was just, well, we were just glad to be here. Everybody got along and everything. But now, I just see the complete switch change, change. Oh, it's really? a big big change you know and uh i don't know if it's because a lot of people come here from different places i don't know what it was but it is not the same hospitality that it used to be you know uh it's just it's just not the same i mean it's not a it's not a it, before my dad used to say i'm taking you guys back to the country i don't want you to grow up in the city in cleveland you know and we said my cousins they all live in cleveland now are you guys going back down south well, we didn't know what down south meant, but I said, yeah, I guess we are. And, you know, we said they got chickens, they have pigs, they have cows. In Mansfield. Yeah, in Mansfield, they said, oh, yeah, you're going down south then. Well, they probably ain't never seen a real cow or nothing mm -hmm. like that. And so now it's just completely different. It's not the same little hospitality, you know, group, you know. It's just not the same. Okay, I heard, I heard y'all mention a little sum about church earlier. Could you tell me more about your church? I said it again. I, I can't hear very oh, I, was, I was asking, could you tell me more about your church? Like My church is? Yeah. Well, our church as, is, as I said, I belong to now the church right on the corner here. But I've lived, uh, I've always been in church all my life, just about one or the other. I, like I said, I don't mind. When I was living on out north end down there, I went to Mount Hermon. Because my kids were small, my one of them one of them go to Sunday school and church and thing. So they was right around the corner. And they all started at the church before I even started going to the Mount Hermon church. And then I got to be going to Mount Hermon. But as far as the church is concerned, uh, they haven't changed too much, I tell you, the churches. Is. But now uh, the churches, we got many, they got many white going in churches, we got black going to some the churches now, you know. Used to be a time maybe, you know, it was all maybe black churches, but they're not now. Most well, everybody in our church is kin to each other, so. <laughs> and then the other kin lives, go to her church. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a big family, you know. Some of them have ventured out to smaller groups, but they're all just about all kin. Yeah, well, like I said now, our families is so mixed up. Because, like, I got my family, I got white. I said red and yellow, black and white. <laughs> I got red ones, I got white ones, and I got black ones. And I got yellow ones, so I got some Japanese, I got some Japanese grandkids. Yeah, you know? well, the kids just marry who they want. Mm -hmm. so. so I mean, I, I don't know how can I separate them from anybody else when I know they all we all took 
together, you know, I guess. So yeah. I just say, when they say, what you got to go? Yeah, Red, we, yellow, black, and white. <laughs> uh, I, we had to laugh because uh, my son was married to a white girl, and he's got three daughters. And then my grandson, he's got four or five, four or five babies by my white Columbus, girl. Columbus and Detroit, I got Oh, in Detroit, yes, she got about four six or five seven. White. And, and my, uh, my granddaughter, the one that I told you was my son's uh, daughter, the mother picked him out to be the father of a girl. He only had one kid. She's got three mixed kids. So we just got it. Then the mother, sister, her son's married to a Japanese girl, and they live over in Japan. And uh, so we just we just got a whole calico family. I can't, I can't separate people. Her, her, her apartment is just the walls are just covered with all these kids, you know. Mm -hmm. I got one little guy to get uh, uh, Whitney. Whitney. Yeah, my she, granddaughter's going to say, Peace, you guys from Mansfield? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Whitney uh, we used to play basketball at St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. You know Whitney? Okay, she just graduated from college last week. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. She had now a full she's ride. She's mixed up. She mixed yeah. Up. And then uh, Anne Marie will be playing next year. She she had to set out. She mm -hmm. tore the ACL. But, uh, and Whit Kristen, she'll graduate next year from Cincinnati. But they all was big stars at St. Pete's playing basketball. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's a lot of Lindsay kids in my husband's family that play. They're all related, all of them. He's got about 300 nieces and nephews and great nieces. Yeah, 300 of them right in, here. Right here in town. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I went to school with a Lamont Lindsay when I was in Okay, Lamont John is Simpson. his nephew. Is that his nephew? Uh -huh. I think yeah. that's, his, that's his nephew's son. I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So Lamont's dad is one of the twins. We're trying to get a family reunion together now with them. This is so many of them. Mm -hmm. so he had five uncles. His dad had 15 brothers and sisters, and five of the uncles lived right here in town, and they got like five generations or six generations of people. Wow. Yeah. So they've got a large, large family. You want to tell us about your fondest memory growing up? And like, I can't really say the North End, but. Man, of uh, in Mansfield period. Back her father. Just I like find the fondest memories. Just any good memories. Good uh -oh. memories. I don't know. But when he died, he's so young. I mean, my kids was all small when my husband died. Really. So, uh, I, 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 so they were these kids that was pretty well grown up when before they before they daddy died and everything. But uh, as I said, when he died, he. He had started, he come, went, to, went to service, and when he come back from service, he was a drunken man. I think the service, uh, what they didn't, uh, got him out of jobs and things like that, it turned him into drunks. I mean, he started looking, doing things, they had no business doing things like that. And so he had, he had taken on, taken so much alcohol that he died with, um, with this here, what you call this? Uh, Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis of the liver. But he worked at the brass. He worked, yeah, he worked at brass, all that. Before, that's before he went to service, so. Yeah. So he, I mean, if, I, maybe the service didn't make men out of them, you know. So the service would make men, but it's coordinate. So if they come back and can't find jobs and do the things they want to do like that, they start that drinking habit and things like that. Yeah. Well, that's so, what's called, that's what's happening with the young men today, young black men they can't find jobs because they don't have any trade and they find out dealing dope and stuff is the big thing. Well, they get learn that from, you know, we got a, we got four prisons in this town and you know, oh, everybody is not in there for life. And when those guys come out, they, they're not going to get a job. You can, you can hang it up. Anything on your record, you cannot get a job in Mansfield. And if the jobs were here, you weren't going to get a job. So these guys come out and they just go to the next best thing. And I said, well, who's taking all the drugs in the first place? You know, how can you sell drugs? But there are some that's selling them and some that's taking them. And those that are taking them, I guess it's depression or whatever. And they're just so like homeless. How, how do you get so many homeless people in town? You, we never heard of homeless people. But we got an overcrowd up here on 3rd Street and some more that's this bumming around mm -hmm. and uh, you go past and you see 10 or 12 guys sitting on the porch no job 
So they're not working anywhere. They're not being productive. So will they sit, sit around and get drunk to stay high or whatever? But then you see a half of them sitting down there with new cars and fine gold well, and off and all yes. that stuff like that. And they ain't got no job. Not four or five cars, but yeah. Not so they so, must be doing all right with whatever they're doing illegal. Yeah. yeah. But illegal. they used to be, I mean, they used to be. You can't even sell a, a hot dog on the side of the street because the health department's right on. You got to do it this year, this way. You got to do it that way, and so a lot of things where guys used to make money doing, they can't do it no more. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't, and so that there uh, limits the uh, jobs and stuff. So, uh, and it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse unless they bring some jobs. But then Mansfield will never get the jobs. They got to get rid of the Chamber of Commerce first, you know. They need, they got them old guys up there that's been there too long, and there's nothing new ideas coming in. They want to make this a retirement town, but retirement don't pay the taxes. That's why I tell them at my church, everybody here is on fixed income, so you don't get no big money. And the same way go for the town, you know. Everybody work can't work at McDonald's. You, you, you go in there, the, the old people are working and the young people, everybody's trying to get a job, you know? Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's, 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 it's a bad thing. And if you can't attract nobody to your town, to this going up, now, now they said the guy the General Motors place, they're not coming. Oh, really? Yeah, they're not going to come now. Gosh. And see, they were supposed to do 500 jobs, you know? Yeah. So that, I hadn't heard not, that yet, not, wow. Yeah, and you got a, you got a governor fight against the casinos, 6,000 jobs. Can't come. So now what the people don't get? It? No, the they're fighting it. They're, oh, he wants they're supposed he, to get it. Cool. If you get 6,000 people getting a paycheck, you're going to get some taxes out of their paycheck, and the place is going to pay. And you got Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus. All of them are doing a casino. And putting a hold on that. I mean, one casino will give you about 6,000 jobs because, you know, you got the construction people that's building and all that. And you stopping that? So everybody's going to Detroit, Indiana, Cincinnati, I mean, uh, uh, West Virginia. That's where they go. And we get bus loads going. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's just going to be a bad way until you get somebody that says, uh, let, it, let it come. Let's, don't worry about, you know, they got these people at the church talking about, oh, no, that's bad. Don't tell people how to spend their money. If that's what you want to do, that's just like you kind of you can't stop them from smoking cigarettes. You can't stop them from drinking. Let them go to the casino and spend whatever they want, cause they done paid their taxes. They, you already taking it out their check anyway. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know what? It's not enough young people stepping up saying that. We got old people running the state, mm -hmm. and seeing that, and that's that hurts. You need more young people. You know, in the 40s and 50s, going up there and run for mayor and running for governor and stuff. Get them old people out of there. You know, I'm I'm old myself. I, I wouldn't want to be up there running, but I got better ideas than some of the old ones that's up there my age. I agree. So, well, that's pretty much. Are you about done? Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much. Did you have anything quickly you wanted to add or? You we, we covered we covered a lot of ground today. Yeah, well, I talked about everything. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Well, we want to thank you both very much yeah, for your time. Thank you. It was yeah, thank you. Very informative. Yeah, very so, thank you very much. I can use some of it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>